Good afternoon. Thank you again for coming. Um, my name is Michael Kleeman. I'm one of the coordinators for the conference. It's my pleasure to introduce um, Senator Casco Buffington, who's put together this panel for us. A little bit of background. When we were putting together the conference, um, we were trying to make certain that we had the broadest possible definition of public service media. Uh, one of the issues in the past has been that, if you will, traditional broadcast media was perceived to be old and bad, and therefore beyond broadcast originally was things that weren't broadcast. Uh, and new media, of course, is everything's perfect and good. Um, the real world doesn't work like that. And what we realize that in any revolution, that what arrives out of the old and the new is a synthesis, a synthesis, and someone who can speak, a synthesis, and not something that ignores the old. And so although this is primarily a panel around broadcast, we think it's really important because it talks about the principles of how one uses media to provide a service to the community that, that, that it resides in. And so we're really delighted that uh, Sandra has been able to coordinate and put together this panel. Um, she's the director of the, health, the Hollywood Health and Society program at the Norman Lear Center, which is affiliated with USC Annenberg. And this is a relatively interesting organization that provides um, entertainment professionals with accurate and timely information um, that they can include health-related program material in their scripts and activities. And so it really helps bring accuracy and topicality, if you will, into uh, television and other broadcast programming. Um, I think they do it because they understand that broadcasting and certainly um, uh, very attractive and widely viewed programs have a massive effect on the population and that we need to be mindful of how we use it. Um, Sandra's got a long experience, over 30 years working worldwide uh, in the health area. She was formerly the vice president of the Center for Development of and Population Activities, um, flagship women's lead program, and worked um, across 140 countries. Her resume is long and impressive as she is, and I'm certain you'd rather listen to her and her colleagues. Um, so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce her and let her take the panel from here, and thank you for your attendance. Thanks, Well, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for the opportunity to present this panel today. And I'd also like to thank my staff who are here in the audience, Kathy Lee, Courtney Singer, Allison Curry, and Chris DiZalu. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing two of the best storytellers in the world. We have Neil Baer and Zoanne Clack. Neil Baer is a medical doctor he co-created The House is Small, But the Welcome is Big, an amazing documentary film about AIDS orphans in Mozambique. He's a Harvard-trained physician, a, pa a practicing pediatrician, and an award-winning television writer and producer. Since 2000, he's been the showrunner and executive producer of NBC series Law and Order Special Victims Unit. And before that, he was executive producer of ER. He's also, he was an adjunct professor at USC in the areas of health communication, health promotion, disease prevention, and sex education. Dr. Baer's primary medical interests are in adolescent health. He has written extensively for teens on topics such as teen pregnancy, AIDS, drug and alcohol abuse, and nutrition. He serves on numerous boards, and he happens to be the co-chair of Hollywood Health and Society, our board. Um, Dr. Baer has an, a unique ability to address the intersection between health, social issues, and media. And as a television writer and producer, for example, he's developed public health messages in conjunction with stories from the hit TV show ER, as well as after school specials for teens on STDs. He has presented locally, locally and internationally, and is a partner with Hollywood Health and Society in expanding our program across the globe. So let's welcome Neil Baer. I also have the pleasure of introducing Zoanne Clack. Zoanne is a medical doctor with a master's degree in public health and is also a supervising producer of the award-winning ABC series, Grey's Anatomy. She went to Northwestern University with a major in radio, TV, and film, 
but switched her major to communication studies with a concentration in neurobiology. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> um, so that was the way she met her pre-med requirements. Um, she later practiced medicine for 10 years. And uh, she did a fellowship in emergency medicine and later um, helped to develop an emergency medicine program in response to the bombing of the American Embassy in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And she had a, a happier role in expanding emergency medicine to the Pacific Island paradise of Palau. Um, deciding to pursue a career in entertainment, Dr. Clack moved to Los Angeles and was able to quickly integrate into Hollywood life by landing a staff writer position with the show Presidio Med in 2001. She spent a short time as medical advisor on ER and now works on Grey's Anatomy, Grey's Anatomy and continues to practice uh, shifts in the emergency department. So let's welcome Zoanne. So the way we're going to do this, I'm going to present first and then we'll have uh, Neil and Zoanne present. So over the last 150 years, incredible breakthroughs in public health have enabled humans to live longer and healthier lives. But the benefit of public health interventions have yet to reach many of the world's poor. At the same time, we have new powerful ways of reaching people through entertainment media and through new media. So our panel will talk about the powerful effect of uniting public health and entertainment media. Nelson Mandela, quoting Marianne Williamson, said, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. It's from this perspective that we take on the challenge of global health through the use of entertainment media. So what is entertainment? What do you think of when you hear the word entertainment? Many of us think of movies, uh, sh t television shows, radio, concerts. But we ask for you to think of entertainment differently. Think of it as the way that messages grab and hold our attention. And think of it not just as a sector of the economy, but as a driving force, maybe the driving force of daily life today. News, politics, education, religion, commerce, the arts. Today, there is scarcely a domain of human existence unaffected by the battle for eyeballs, the imperative to amuse, the need to stimulate, to tell us stories, to play with us. The stakes for society are enormous. Entertainment education is not new. It takes many forms. It has been used for political and social change over the years, which has impacted health. Does anybody know who this woman is? Nobody? This is Margaret Sanger, the founder of the birth control movement. So Hollywood Health and Society harnesses the power of entertainment media to improve the health and well-being of individuals and communities worldwide. We're in our eighth year of funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and we also have grants from the California Endowment to focus on the social determinants of health disparities, a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to focus on global health, and we have funding from HRSA's Division of Organ Transplantation and the Poison Control Program. So Hollywood Health and Society uses a proactive form of outreach to the creative community to provide accurate and timely public health information. We do this through briefings. We take experts to the writers' rooms. Uh, we do this by responding to their inquiries. We provide consultations by phone and email. We reach out through our Real to Real newsletter, which is published quarterly and reaches 680 writers. Uh, we have tip sheets on specific health topics. We also work with networks to develop pu public service announcements and refer viewers to credible sources of information through web links and through 1-800 numbers. Um, we have a partnership with the Writers Guild of America West, so we hold uh, panel discussions at the Writers Guild on uh, key medical topics that draw 75 to 100 writers at a time. And I think most importantly, we evaluate the impact of TV health storylines on viewers. How does it impact their knowledge, attitudes, and behavior? That's the key. 
So let's take a look at an example. Uh, we'll see a clip from an episode of Grey's Anatomy. This is Zoanne's program. Um, this episode is called A Piece of My Heart. Um, and listen to the messages about preventing maternal to child spread of HIV. I'm sorry that took so long. Congratulations, you're pregnant. You're sure? It's a big day for pregnant ladies. Pregnant ladies everywhere I turn, it's weird. So I'm only supposed to give you a couple of these, but this is like a month's supply of prenatal vitamin samples. They're free. No, I... We need to schedule an abortion. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I... I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I don't mean to intrude, but... You might want to sit with this for a few days before you make your decision. So, there's no decision to make. I'm HIV positive. I knew it. You disapprove. You're here to push some kind of agenda, right? No. No. Listen, if you want to have an abortion because you want to have an abortion, then that's between you and whatever God you believe in. But if you want to have an abortion because you think that's what medicine is telling you to do, then that's between you and me. I was ineffectual. It was unclear. I've been on my heels a little bit lately, and I was unclear, so just listen, okay? I wasn't telling you there is some chance your baby might not be born sick. I was telling you there is a 98% chance your baby could be born perfectly healthy. A 98% chance. There's a higher chance of your baby being born with Down syndrome than there is of you passing HIV onto your child. I don't... I just... I, I can't... I know you gave up about having children a long time ago. I understand that it's difficult to readjust your thinking so quickly, but Sarah, if you take your meds responsibly, there's no reason why you can't have a beautiful, healthy baby. This is your chance, if you want it. This is your chance to be a mom. A 98% chance. 98% chance. So the Kaiser Family Foundation and Hollywood Health and Society consulted on this episode. And the Kaiser Family Foundation did an impact evaluation with three random telephone surveys of 1,500 regular viewers. There was a survey one week before the storyline aired, a, a survey a week after it aired, and another one six weeks later. And this episode reached 17.5 million viewers. So here's one finding. The question was, as far as you know, if a woman who is HIV positive becomes pregnant and receives the proper treatment, what is the chance that she will give birth to a healthy baby? That is, a baby who is not infected with HIV. So the percentage of viewers who got the answer right, and the right answer was greater than a 90% chance, uh, before the episode only 15% of viewers got the answer right. A week after the episode, 61% got it right. And there's a drop-off, which is to be expected, at six weeks to 45%. To so from baseline to the six weeks point, there was a threefold or 300% increase in knowledge around maternal to child transmission of HIV. And if you do the math with the 17.5 million viewers, that means that over 8 million viewers learned from this episode for the first time about the 98% chance of having a healthy baby. And by the way, it's now 99%. So the data have changed a little bit from the time of this briefing. Now, we're going to look at a clip from Law & Order SVU, Neil's show. Um, this episode is called Retro. And Hollywood Health and Society, under our Global Health Initiative, took uh, medical experts to consult with Neil and his writers on HIV and AIDS in Africa. And the focus of this briefing was on HIV deniers people who don't believe that HIV causes AIDS. I'm actually going to give you a little summary of this um, amazing storyline, because we're going to see a short clip. Let's see if I can, here we go. So Detective Elliot Stabler and his partner, Detective Olivia Benson, are called to duty when a baby is abandoned, and it is clear that there has been negligence in the baby's HIV treatment. Her caretakers, a couple from Gambia, 
hold the belief that HIV can be cured in a holistic way based off the teachings from leaders in their country. The couple takes the baby to a doctor in the U.S. who shares similar beliefs. The detectives learn of a group, HIV deniers, that believe that HIV does not lead to AIDS. Uh, investigating another family treated by the same doctor, the detectives work to solve the crime of a malpracticing doctor, expose the truth about HIV, and provide hope to those who are tested early and treated with ARVs. So let's take a look at the clip. Kids only get this sick when they're not treated. They're treated for what? HIV. She has AIDS. Yeah, advanced. And her parents didn't do a damn thing about it. Is it loud enough? Want to see some hocus pocus? Check out Dr. Demento's website. Truth about HIV. There's no proof that HIV causes AIDS. The anti-HIV medications Big Pharma makes will kill you. This guy is a fruitcake. According to Hutton, AIDS is a global conspiracy funded by pharmaceutical companies to make big bucks. And commit genocide. My parents believe the government created HIV in a lab, and the CIA spread it in the prisons to kill blacks and gays. How does a doctor believe this crap? He's an AIDS denier, part of a misguided minority who believes that HIV doesn't cause AIDS and that AIDS itself doesn't exist. Two-thirds of the world's HIV-positive kids get infected during pregnancy or at birth from the mother. The rest acquire it during breastfeeding. Okay, so Susan could have passed the virus to Lisa either way. It's a shame. HIV-positive women in this country have a 98% chance of having a healthy baby if they take antiretrovirals during pregnancy and put the child on meds after birth. Which Susan probably didn't do because she thinks HIV is harmless. Yeah, she put Lisa's life in danger by breastfeeding her and by withholding medication when Lisa got sick. And since any reasonable person knows HIV causes AIDS, that's criminally negligent homicide. HIV attacks the life-saving T cells that fight disease. The virus genetically mutates the host cell, turning it into an HIV factory, which makes more copies of the virus. Eventually, HIV kills T cells faster than the body can replenish them destroying the immune system and causing AIDS. Dr. Warner, can you tell the jury how we know this? HIV has been isolated, photographed, cultured, and grown outside the human body. Its genetic structure is fully documented, and it's killed more than 25 million people since 1981, including Lisa Ross. So Hollywood Health and Society conducted an impact eval of this episode. And what we found, uh, we did, we contracted with a research firm to administer a pre and post test of 1,200 regular viewers of primetime TV. And we found an increased knowledge of HIV among those who had never been tested for HIV, an increased awareness of AIDS deniers for females, and an association between HIV knowledge and increased global health priorities for females. So we're very interested in whether this association between an increase in knowledge about global health topics will also increase um, prioritization of global health over things like global defense. And we're going to be testing this for the next three years. We also work with daytime soaps. Um, and this is an example from The Bold and the Beautiful. I'm not going to show you the clip on this one just to save time. But this was also an HIV storyline about this young man, Tony, who in one episode learns he's HIV positive. In another episode, he tells his fiance, Kristen, that he's, you know, of his status, that he's positive. They later get married and go to Africa and adopt um, this little boy. So let's take a look at the results. Um, we developed a PSA, and it was aired at two dramatic plot points on August 3rd and on August 13th, the red arrows. Uh, August 3rd was the day Tony learned he was HIV positive, and August 13th was the day he told Kristen. Now, we also tracked all of the other references in the media to this AIDS hotline call-in number. 60 Minutes, the Surgeon General's campaign, MTV, and the, and the highest peak in callers all year was on August 13th when Tony told Kristen of his status. That resulted in 5,313 calls in a single day to this AIDS hotline. Okay, so now we're going to go to a new genre. Um, some of you may recognize Dr. Atul Gawande um, in this picture. Uh, Dr. Gawande is a Harvard-trained surgeon, practicing surgeon, 
and he's also a full-time staff writer with The New Yorker. And he happens to have two best-selling books on the top 10 list of Amazon.com. Um, we were introduced to Dr. Gawande by Neil Baer, and he agreed to serve as a subject matter expert. And we took him to do a briefing with the writers of ER. And what he talked about was the surgical safety checklist featured here. And this is something he has developed with the World Health Organization. And the research estimates that the use of this checklist, which is a little piece of paper that can be folded up and put in your pocket, and takes all of two minutes to use, can uh, reduce complications due to surgery by 50% worldwide. So let's look at um, how this factored into an episode of ER, which was aired just in, on March 12th, and it was one of the final episodes of ER when all of the original cast members came back. George Clooney, Juliana Margulies, Noah Wiley, and Eric LaSalle. We have a visitor. I don't remember being asked if Dr. Benton could scrub in for this. I'm a friend of the patient. He asked if I would observe him. Uh-huh. Put him under. Let's do this. Whoa, whoa. What about the checklist? Excuse me? Safe surgery checklist? I've had ten cases today, doctor. All the more reason to take the necessary precautions. Could only take a minute. One minute. John Carter here for a right cadaveric renal allograft. Does the patient have a known allergy? No. Does anesthesia anticipate a difficult airway? No. Is the risk of bleeding greater than 500 cc's? I sure as hell hope not. Let's go put him under. Whoa, 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 whoa. Everybody slow down. Now let's just take our time and introduce the room. What's next? We all hold hands and sing Kumbaya? Sheila Lane, scrub nurse. Paula Cheney, circulating nurse. Kay Schumacher, anesthesiologist. Randall Okerman, chief surgical resident. Ethan Dean, surgical intern. Peter Benton, observing general surgeon. Any concerns from the surgical team? Oh, my God, you're wasting my time. Any nursing concerns? We don't have any reperfusion solution. We won't be needing it. I'll have some set up. Were any antibiotics given in the last 60 minutes? Just starting them now. Ten blade. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. If you run the antibiotics prior to incision, you cut the risk of infection by half. Dr. Benton, you're a guest here, and I don't like guests. As a friend of the patient, you're welcome to sit, observe, and shut up. They donor left atrium to the native arterial cuff. Arterial and venous anastomoses are complete. Releasing the clamp. Suture lines look good, no leaks. Other PDF for the ureter. Shouldn't it be picking up by now? What happened to sitting quietly in the corner, Dr. Benton? No, seriously, shouldn't it be? Sometimes it takes a minute. I don't have a parenchymal pulse. We've got an arterial thrombosis. Reclamp and take down the sutures. Sateski, please. Where's the clock? Renal artery is obstructing the blood flow. Gonna have to take it out and start all over again. Problem solved. Flush with heparin saline and reperfusion solution. Reperfusion solution? We've got it. We're all set. Oh, well, it's a good thing we just had some laying around, huh? How long did it take to get the reperfusion solution up from the pharmacy? Fifteen minutes. What happens if you don't have the reperfusion solution? You made your point, doctor? No, I disagree, doctor. I think that this is an excellent teaching opportunity. You'd have had 15 minutes of warm ischemia, the organ would have taken a major blow, and there's a good chance we would have ended up with a non-functioning kidney. Wouldn't you agree, doctor? If we're all done teaching here, perhaps some of you would like to assist me in getting this kidney back into the patient's body. Where do you get a copy of that checklist? No, people! Love that. Oops. Let's see if we can go this way. There we go. So uh, this episode was aired on a Thursday night. Friday morning at 6 a.m., there was a meeting uh, in New York at Maimonides Hospital of 150 surgeons. To their surprise, they were shown the entire hour-long episode of ER, and then they took a vote and decided to adopt the checklist for their orthopedics surgical practice. Um, this clip was shown at the World Health Assembly in Geneva at, last month in May by Dr. Gawande to all the health ministers of the world. And I got a, an email about three days after it aired from the head of um, quality assurance and quality control for the country of France um, requesting a clip for their national stakeholder meeting on safe surgical practices. So we know 
that physicians watch this show, so do policymakers, um, that television reaches a lot of different sectors of society. Uh, we placed a link on the show's website to the uh, World Health Organization's website to their sa surgical safety checklist um, page. So let's go to the next. I'm going to close with a clip on bipolar disorder in a TV storyline. This was in 90210, a show for uh, teenagers. And it was an episode called Off the Rails. And I, I'd like to show this because it's really an illustration of integration with new media. Um, we, Hollywood Health and Society, took a psychiatrist to consult with the writers to give them an accurate picture of what a young person with bipolar disorder looks like and acts like. Um, this developed into a six-week story arc. And the writers actually had multiple con uh, consultations with our psychiatrist. And they later sent us the rough edits of all six episodes which we sat and watched with the psychiatrist. And so there was a real commitment on the part of the, of the show writers to accuracy. So let's take a look. Silver, it's me, it's Dixon. Listen, I do understand, I do. Everything was so good for you. And, and now it feels like the world is crumbling around you. Everything made sense and now it doesn't. But it's okay, Silver. I know what you're going through. Because my mom used to go through the same type of thing. Some days, she was so happy she couldn't contain herself. Like, one day she just took me out of school. Just showed up in the middle of the day and took me out of school. Said we were going to Disneyland. But she didn't stay happy. By the time we got there, she was just sad, confused. We didn't end up leaving the motel room. That's how she was. Up and down, up and down. But that wasn't her fault. She just needed help, so it's okay, right? I'm here. And I'm gonna help you get help. Everything's gonna be okay. So the network let us develop PSA. Um, we did this in collaboration with SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. And you can see here uh, the PSA on the CW website. Um, I'm going to show you this PSA was also aired during that six-week story arc at Dramatic Plot Points. I'll show you the PSA. Oh, there's a long lead-in, I just remembered. Um, we also got some viral media exposure. I'll show you that um, after this PSA. Every teen goes through ups and downs, but as you saw with Silver, bipolar disorder symptoms are more extreme than that. They might include severe depression, high anxiety, sleeplessness, racing thoughts, or recklessness. But there is good news. Bipolar disorder can be treated, and youth with this illness can lead full and productive lives. For more information on bipolar disorder and how to get help, Call the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration at 1-877-SAMHSA7. That's 1-877-726-4727.
or visit the Child and Adolescent Bipolar Foundation website at www.bpkids.org 90210. This is the landing page um, that they referred to. And Perez Hilton picked it up. And let's see. Uh, Your Majesty Ms. G points out, Perez, you were watching 90210 last night. Ha, ha, ha. Because he's got a little reference here on the, on the lower right to uh, bipolar disorder. So there's a real integration of traditional media and new media, and definitely two-way, or you know, more than two-way communication. It isn't just one, one direction. So we know that entertainment education connects us globally. It can save lives, it can improve health, and it can en enhance well-being around the world. So thank you. So now we're going to hear from Neil Baer, and let's see if I can. Okay. Thanks for having me. I'll speak briefly. And will there be time for questions? Then? Yes. Okay, great. So. Um, when I started on ER, I drew from my own experiences as a, as a medical student at Harvard. And while I was on ER, I was doing my residency as well. So I was able to bring real stories to the show. And I felt that that wasn't enough. And I still think about that a lot in terms of um, public health issues on both ER and SVU. And when I was on ER, I did with um, Kaiser Family Foundation a project where it was called uh, Following ER, where we took uh, topics that had public health um, interests like screening for breast cancer or transplantation issues, you name it. Every, every week there was some kind of public health issue that was discussed in some way or another on ER. And we did a, a news media piece where the local NBC affiliate from Baltimore at John, and, and in conjunction with Johns Hopkins would do a piece that would augment what we had done on, SV, on, on ER. So they would say, tonight as you saw, and they'd show a little clip, and then there would be a piece. And then this, this was then, in a sense, viraled out. It was before really viraling. But it was sent to all the other NBC affiliates, and then they could air it that night after ER or the next day. And they could choose which ones, and they could adjust it to make it fit their communities as well. And it was uh, very popular and it lasted for a number of years. And then it was done on Chicago Hope as well. So cut to, that was in the late 90s now, 10 years later, what can we do using new media to augment um, what's on broadcast media? So I think about that a lot. And um, in terms of SVU, how can I take issues and hopefully those are issues that are uh, rife with uh, um, points for discussion for, uh, between and amongst the viewers, how can I use new media to um, press beyond just what's been shown on SVU? So there are a number of things that I think about. Uh, so it's not just that's why the title for my little presentation is Twittering. You know, I do Twitter now, and I just did it before. Um, it. So there are a number of things that I think about. So. And I've been influenced by trips I've taken to Africa as well, and how m cell phones are used to um, promote um, uh, health improvement and to communicate uh, health issues, issues on vaccinations and things like that uh, through areas that don't have um, really entrenched infrastructures for communication. So cell phones, computers, and, and, and the like. So. I think a lot about that. So for Twittering, um, I started about a month ago. So now I have about 1,000 followers. Mm -hmm. And I didn't try to recruit them. Now Ice-T has about 10,000. So and, we're, and we follow each other. I don't really follow anybody, but I just like picked randomly some, some followers and put them up as people I follow just to make it look good. <laughs> and, um, but uh, the point is, is that I can impart information about the show in various ways. 
um, and I can also answer questions. And it does, it's very, been very interesting. It's a link between me and the viewer. So they'll ask me lots of crazy questions, and I can choose which ones, I, which ones to answer and which ones not to. I can also put up Twitter bubbles so I can show behind the scenes footage of um, a, a scene being shot and do things that the network just can't do and the network doesn't do on their own website. So it's really opened up this realm of, of options for me. I can talk about um, the health issues uh, or the social issues that are on the show and I can send people to different places. It's pretty, pretty amazing and they can hopefully send them out to others and the, the viral and capacity is kind of open in, uh, to, to what can be done. So I also like it because I can beat the gossip colonists now because they really aggravate me when they say things about the show that one not true or they give away things. So I can, I can um, handle the the uh, the the news bits that come out about guest stars or or, or what, whatever I want to say. Um, it's not to say that I don't like having TV Guide or Entertainment Weekly or any of the others put out the information. I want to recruit viewers, but it's it's.